And you know the only thing that's keeping it from happening? Me and you. You and I. For you English professors. You see, I believe if I were to ask this morning that by show of hands, how many of you in here would really like to know that your life is going to help change the world? I believe everybody in here would raise their hand. Certainly you do. We want our lives to matter. We want our lives to make a difference. We want our lives to have an impact. That's what we're going to look at this morning in our text. Jesus with one encounter with one particular individual. But it's real easy for us to begin to think, but, but what can I do? I'm only one. And pastor, when I look around, everything I see on the news seems to be bad. It seems like everything in our nation is getting worse. It's just violence and crime and all this stuff. What can I do? You see, far too often we make the mistake of thinking that in order to change the world, it has to be some kind of big, earth-shattering event. And a lot, a lot of us, just like this morning, if I were to actually ask that question in seriousness, how many of you want to change the world, some of you would instantly put your hands up. Some of you, on the other hand, would say, well, tell me what i got to do first. Believing that it has to be some big earth-shattering event is just a trick and a lie of the enemy. Because for those who are sitting back waiting on that big event to come, that big time, that big situation, whatever it may be, while you're waiting, life is passing by. And you're going to look up one day and be 60 years old and realize that big event ain't never come. What I hope and pray that we will be able to see through this encounter this morning in some testimony or pieces of that I'm going to share some things that happened in this church, that we change the world one act and one person at a time. Now, granted, there will be occasionally those type of events, be it a, a Billy Graham crusade type of thing where there's a multitude of people, but for the most part, as the general rule, you and I, as children and agents of God, are going to change this world one act, one person at a time. Because every time you change someone's life or you allow God to allow you to be a part of that change, you have, in fact, helped change the world. And to sit back and think it's got to be one of those big earth-shattering events is just not true. Because oftentimes, something is actually much simpler than we may think. We just need to make sure that we clearly understand it and that we clearly communicate it, which is part of my job. Yesterday, Joshua and Angie were leaving to go to Beth and Lance's daughter's wedding, and it happened to be down at this place in Dublin. Well, I had been down there on Friday afternoon the day before for the wedding rehearsal. And actually never knew the place was there. Gorgeous place. It's actually a vineyard with a big fish pond and, you know, just a beautiful outdoor setting. But one of the things I discovered down there in the pond is they have some humongous catfish swimming around in this pond. And out on the pier are one of those like a gumball machine that they have filled up with fish food. So you can put a quarter in the machine, get your thing, and stand there and feed them and watch the big catfish come up. And, you know, naturally I was intrigued with that on Friday. So yesterday when Joshua got ready to leave, and I knew he was actually getting down there uh, with his mom about two hours before the wedding itself was going to begin, I walked over to where he was sitting on the couch, and I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out a couple of quarters. And I said, hey, bud, in case you get bored before the wedding starts, you can go out on the pier and feed your catfish. Here you go, take these. And he held his hand, and I put the quarters in there. And he just stared at them. And finally, he said, they eat these? <laughs> and I said, no, son. He said, oh, oh, okay, okay, there's a food machine you put there. Ah, uh, you got it. Sometimes we just don't understand or clearly communicate. But here's the simple truth. Jesus changed the world one act and one person at a time. Now listen, when he went to the cross, it was for the whole world for all time. 
He died for everybody that had ever lived prior. He died for everybody that was living at the time. He died for all of us who had yet to even be born. But when you look at his life, his ministry, and what he did on a day-to-day basis for about three to three and a half years, he changed people's life one act and one person at a time. Take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light unto my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. My heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already, turn with me to the 8th chapter of Luke. And let's begin in verse 26. And I actually, to be honest with you, will apologize to you as your pastor. I think this was supposed to be our text last week. And I was just hurting so bad I could not get my mind to focus and let God do his thing. Beginning in verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When he came out into the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported them to the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man with whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. But the man for whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, that he... But he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Father, as we look into your word today, I pray that you would help us to look into our own lives, our own hearts, but especially in our day-to-day lives, Lord, and to do a true inventory, if you will or better yet, to allow you to do so. And to ask ourselves, when is the last time that I've helped a complete stranger in a random act of kindness? For Father, if we can't remember that time, we're missing something as your children. I believe part of the very purpose that we were put on this earth. Yes, Lord, we know that you created us to have fellowship with you, live with you, walk with you, to know you and to be known by you. But our purpose here on this earth for the short time that we're here is to reach and to bless as many people as we can other than ourselves. To be willing to be that agent of change, to bring that word of hope, that act of kindness, that helping hand, whatever it may be for whatever that moment demands. Help us, we pray, to get our priorities in order and to give you the full lordship of our lives. We ask you these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, if you study this passage here, 
we actually were studying from here just a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Jesus teaching that no one lights a lamp and, and puts on a stand and then covers it over with a shelter. And after he'd finished this lesson and another, it seems like almost out of the blue, he says to his disciples, hey, let's get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. Okay, Lord, that's what you want to do. We'll do it. And so they get into the boat, and the Bible says they begin to cross over, and this is one of the particular accounts where Jesus actually goes up to the front of the boat and falls asleep, and in the midst of somewhere on their journey, there comes a great storm on the lake. Now, I personally believe just as it is today, just as it has been for all times, any time that God is trying to get to you or to send one of his people to you, the enemy knows what's going on, and he's going to do everything he can to keep it from happening. This storm that come up on that sea that night wasn't a coincidence. It was Satan trying to keep the Son of God from getting to where he needed to go, wanted to go, and to change this life that he knew Satan had been controlling himself for so long, and he didn't want to give him up. So he says, let's go over to the other side. But here's what I want you to know. As again, when you're reading through the text, it almost seems like Jesus is just kind of out of the blue. You know, he's teaching, he's doing his stuff, and then they just... Okay, on a whim, but it's not out of the blue. It was part of the plan. He had a divine appointment with the man on the other side of the lake. The other man, this man on the other side of the lake just didn't know it yet. Do you realize that nothing, nothing is ever out of the blue in your life? There are no coincidences. Every single thing that happens there's some kind of spiritual implication there are no coincidences it's part of a bigger plan oftentimes we're just not tuned in and we don't realize it we don't recognize it as I shared last week when uh, me and a church member were having lunch that day God brought somebody to that table we were supposed to invite we missed it we missed it because I was too caught up in basketball at the moment and it happens to all of us. If we want to be an agent of change in the world, in order to help change the world, we have to be willing to go out of our way. Notice what it says there in verse 26. They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, all the way on the other side of the lake. Matter of fact, it's in the area where we find uh, Bethany and Capernaum. Jesus didn't have very much success there. He actually called down a curse upon them because they're hard-heartedness and unwillingness to listen it was opposite Galilee where things were happening and people were believing it was out of the way yet Jesus was not only willing to stop what he was doing where he was doing it but he gets in a boat and he goes all the way out of his way to get to this one man God has those divine appointments for you and I as well and chances are it's not going to be as dramatic as this situation. It's in the everyday acts of life that we have our eyes open and are tuned in looking for those opportunities. But we have to be willing to go out of the way. You may be on your way home from work. It's been a long day. You're tired. The only thing you can think about is home and that lazy boy recliner and a glass of iced tea. Just If I can just get home and sit in my chair. And all of a sudden, you look over and see somebody broke down. It may be after you've been home and you've had supper. Now you're full and you already kicked back in that chair. And all you can think about is enjoying a nice, peaceful evening, watching maybe your favorite television program. And all of a sudden, that phone rings. Somebody needs a hand. It's in those moments that we choose to or not to be an agent of change and if we keep waiting on that big dramatic moment that big kind of encounter like what jesus has here the chances are you're going to be waiting the rest of your life because you see the other thing is this until you and i get tuned in on the little everyday things to where god knows he can trust us chances are you're not going to be a part of the big thing anyway it don't work that way Remember what Jesus taught repeatedly. If I can't trust you in the little things, I sure ain't going to give you the big ones. 
And the little things are the everyday random acts of kindness that we're willing to go out of our way. It's almost never going to be convenient. But are we willing? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was driving down the road one day and I began to think of an old friend of mine. A friend that I don't think I have seen in a little over 20 years. A very close friend personal friend one of those friendships and you kind of look up one day and wonder how it happened where, where does where does the split and there was never a disagreement nothing like that we just kind of drifted away and I got married and ha- started having kids and he's still single but as I was thinking about him I was wondering I wonder where my old friend is today I wonder what he's doing today I wonder if he is aged like all those other people I went to school with, and I see them, and they've just aged so much, and I don't know what's happened to them because it hadn't happened to me. And then, lo and behold, I walk into Advance Auto last week, and I'm standing at the counter ready to check out and pay for my, my items, and the old friend I'm making reference to, his nickname for me was Ev, just E-V, the first two letters of my last name. And I'm standing there at the counter, and I'm getting ready to pay, and I hear somebody say, Ev, hey Ev, is that you Ev? And I looked down the counter, and there he stood. After 20-some years, listen, it wasn't a coincidence. I don't know why God brought him to my mind. I don't know why after 20 years now our paths just crossed last week. I can't, I can't answer those questions. I don't know if it was for him or for me, or for both of us. But I am absolutely sure it was a divine appointment. I am absolutely sure that God sent me to Israel last year for a divine appointment. Ten days, over 12,000 miles, all for one man. For one man. To be able to share the gospel with one man basically on the other side of the world. I even got a bonus, this Jewish couple that I met from Philadelphia and got to share with them. And listen, it was the highlight of my trip. As awesome as it was to go into Israel, and please, if you haven't been paying attention to the news, pray for Israel. Do you know right now three-quarters of their population are in bomb shelters this morning as we sit here and worship? Three-fourths of the people of that nation right now, as you and I sit here to worship this morning, are somewhere in a bomb shelter. Three-fourths. Please pray for God's nation, Israel. Our homeland, Israel. But out of that trip, as awesome as it was, the historical sites I saw, more than even knowing at times I was walking not only the same path, but very likely along some of the same stones that Jesus himself had walked on. It wasn't the highlight. The highlight was when I found myself in the middle of the Judean desert sharing the gospel with a Palestinian Muslim. That was the highlight. That was the divine appointment. It was the purpose of the whole trip. And don't get me wrong, all the rest of it was awesome. But that was the highlight. But we have to be willing to go out of the way. We have to be willing to break the routine. We have to be willing to be interrupted. And we have to be willing to get involved with something or someone that you don't even know. You just know you're supposed to help. A few weeks ago, when we had the baptism that morning of 14, and then if you came that night or if you didn't, you missed an awesome evening of praise and worship and testimony. And as great as the music was, not only that morning, but even more so that evening, You know what the highlight of the whole day was for me? It began that morning, not just doing the baptisms. It was when I heard one of those young boys say, when I asked if you have anything you want to share, he said, I want to thank the Pauly family because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. And then later that evening, between songs, as some of the other testimonies would share, I heard Daryl get up here and say, because of one person, Not the pastor, I've tried to tell y'all before. You've got more of an advantage outside of these walls than I do. I went to see him twice. You know what he done with my stuff, don't you? He told you, file 13. It went in the trash as soon as he closed the door. 
but it was a member of this church, Patty Dick. So as God wasn't going to give up, he is the hound of heaven. He will track you down, sniff you out, do whatever he's got to do to get to you. And he used Patty to invite Jill, who in turn brought the whole family. Then to hear Heather get up there and talk about Rachel Hudson and how God used Rachel. Folks, listen, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Taking the time to be willing to go out of your way, be interrupted if need be, to share a word, to share a hand. Jesus was willing to go out of his way to help this man who was in desperate need of help, major need of help. And by this type of thing is, is more the exception than the rule. As I said, most of our divine encounters aren't going to be dramatic as this. This guy represents the extreme situation, but he is utterly ruined. Look at verse 27. And when he came out into the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, who had not put on any clothing for a long time, who was not living in a house but in the tombs. This guy's lost his career. He's lost his family. He's lost his home. And now to top it all off, he's lost his mind. And because he had, he didn't realize just how much he needed Christ. It was Jesus who knew how much he needed him. It was Jesus who saw that without his intervening, without his help, without his power being poured out upon this man's life, he had absolutely no help, no hope. We have to be willing to go out of the way. We have to be willing to help others find the way. Look at verses 28 and 29. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had, been command for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Now keep in mind, this guy didn't know how much he needed Jesus. But it wasn't really this guy who was doing the talking here. It was the demonic spirits who had basically already destroyed his life and now had complete and total control of his life. Isn't it ironic that the first thing they request of Jesus is for him not to torture them? The first thing they request of Jesus is that he not torture them. In other words, what they're saying is, listen, Lord, please don't do to us what we've been doing to this guy. Don't do to us what we've been doing to him. Yeah, we've been tormenting him for years. We've destroyed everything he had, woke to have. But, but don't do that to us. Isn't that exactly how Satan works with us sometimes? He leads us to do things to other people that we would never want them to do to us. But if we're not careful, we don't see it that way because it's us doing it. Now, I'm got, not, uh, not going to get real deep into the demon thing here this morning. That's not what this message is about. Some of you may be here this morning and think the whole thing with demons, possession, and all, you may believe that's hocus pocus. You may believe it's outdated. Some may believe it's metaphorical, that it don't really happen that way. It's just, you know, one of them stories that was told in the Bible. But all I'll say is this. If you believe in heavenly angels, then you've got to believe in demons also, which are fallen angels. Can't have one without the other. And if they were real and at work in people's lives during the days that Jesus walked on the earth, what makes you think it's any less true today? Let me show you one passage real quick. Hold your finger there at Luke and turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark records the same story for us. Mark chapter 5. Mark begins by telling us the same way when they get to the other side and gets out of the boat. Immediately here comes the man with the spirits. That he that had been bound with shackles and chains and they'd been torn apart by him. They couldn't hold him, wasn't strong enough. But look at verse 5. It says, constantly night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones 
Do you know there is an epidemic going on in our nation today with teenagers and young adults that cut and gash themselves with sharp instruments? An epidemic cutting themselves. Arms, legs, different places. Some of them say they do it because they can't. It's the only way they can release the pain. It feels like they're about to explode, and by, by making the incision, that it feels like it releases the pressure. Some of them do it because of guilt. Who do you think it is leading them to do this? Some things ain't never changed. It ain't never changed. Believe it or not believe it, some things are true whether you believe them or not. Just funny, as I was preparing this message a couple of nights ago, I happened to be flipping channels, and it was one of those times I couldn't find anything on, so I stopped on some program that was talking about drugs and the effect it's having on people and our nation and all, and what they were really focused on was the people that were hooked on methamphetamines. But you know, one of the things they all share in common, those that are really, really strung out on it, when they begin to having these hallucinations and stuff, you know what they say they always see in their visions? Demons and devils. Demons and devils. Now, as I said, this guy represents the extreme situation which most of us will never encounter. God knows most of us couldn't handle a situation like this without us possibly losing our mind ourselves. But I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I'm ready for this kind of encounter. Can you imagine the scene? You get out of the boat, and here comes this guy running towards you as hard as he can, looking crazy, and he is naked as a jaybird. Now, I'm telling you, even as a pastor this morning, my first reaction would be, if I saw somebody running at me like that, I'm going to be bowed up and probably ready to take him out. Because the first thing I'm going to think is that if some man is running toward me naked, he's got something on his mind that ain't ever crossed my mind. You know what I'm saying? But listen, as bad as this man was, he didn't know how messed up he was. When Satan has you blinded, someone who is walking in the light has to come along and see that they're lost and be willing to show them the way. The demons had drove him out and away from everyone because they didn't want him to take the chance that anyone would get close enough to him to help him. He was living in the tombs. He was living basically where only the dead dwelt. And I guess that's only appropriate because he himself was really dead. You know, that's actually what the Bible says about all who don't know Christ. They are the walking dead. They live, they breathe, they put on clothes, put on makeup, get ready, go do whatever they do. But Jesus said they're walking around like dead people. Matter of fact, he told some of the people of his day that thought they were good, thought they had it all together, thought they were ready. He said, you guys are like these whitewashed tombs. And if you've ever been to Israel, you'll know one of the things they take great joy in is those old stone tombs, whereas they're, keep in mind, our cemeteries here are plush with little ponds and trees and flowers. Their cemeteries there are barren, barren, rock, dry ground. And so how they keep the cemetery looking good is for the tombstones to stay whitewashed, nice and white and bleached. But Jesus told some of those who thought they had it all together during the time he walked this earth. He said, you guys are like those whitewashed tombs. You look real good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. So you and I have not only got to be willing to go out of our way, we have to be willing to show them the way. Take time to learn their story. Look at verse 30 and 31. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go into the abyss. Even though Jesus knew all these things, he still takes time to even ask the demons what their names are. Let's wrap this up. Verse 32. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well, and all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. 
You know what never ceases to amaze me? How many times I've seen over the years in my life, and even before ministry, but especially afterwards, how many times in the life of a family or friendships that there's somebody who, let's say, is kind of like this man right here, the, a black sheep of the family, if you will. Their whole life is in shambles, whether it's an addiction to alcohol or to drugs or to gambling or whatever it may be. It's one of those people in their circle of family or friends that their whole life is just shambles. And it seems like it's been this way for years, and it seems like it's going to continue to be that way for years. What has never ceased to amaze me in those situations, though, is this, that sometimes how I've seen friends or family members go the distance and then some to help those that continue to fall and fall and fall again. And they keep continuing to help, and they keep continuing to help. But for some, if they happen to find Jesus and they are set free from the life of shame and guilt and failure by the power of God and they experience transformation, those same family or friends will sometimes turn their back on them so quick it will make their head spin. As long as they're broken and failing, they help, 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 help right there. But as soon as they discover it's Jesus that set them free man don't don't come around me down there that much don't don't ask me for no more help I wonder why that is they don't have anything else to do with it some of you here today may have experienced this firsthand in your own life we have to be willing to get out of the way we have to be willing to show them the way we have to be willing to go all the way verse 37 and all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and surrounding districts asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into a boat and returned. Unbelievable, right? They wanted Jesus to go. Get away from here, man. Get. And notice God is always the perfect gentleman. They asked him to leave. What did he do? He got in the boat and left. No qualms, no questions, no conflict. If you don't want me here, I'm gone. When we're willing to go all the way, somebody might show you the way to the door. But remember, you're only there for one reason. You have a divine appointment with one. And if we allow the Spirit to work through us, that one we encounter will never be the same. Don't worry about the rest of them. Don't worry if the whole crowd turns on you. Don't worry if they show you the door. And please don't miss something here. Jesus never healed this man from any kind of physical infirmity. He never touched him that we know of. He didn't lay hands on him. He didn't do any of those things. The only thing he did was speak words of truth into this man's life and used his authority to cast out the demons that this man didn't have the power to do on his own. By the power of Christ's words, this man's life was forever changed. And you and I have been given that kind of authority if we'll choose to live in it. The Bible says that as children of Christ, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You and I have been given the authority and the power to speak words of life into people's lives that are dead. Words of freedom. That words that will forever change the course of one person's life. And that's how we change the world. One act, one person at a time. Notice one last thing and I'll close. Verse 38 and 9. But the man for whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. The crowd was asking him to leave, but the man was begging, can I please go with you? Can I go with you, Lord? And when we see God use us as part of the agent of change, you and I need to worship and celebrate like we've never worshipped and celebrated before. Listen, all those people that I talked about a minute ago, when they were sitting out here last Sunday night or a couple of weeks ago on that Sunday evening or that Sunday morning, 
You don't have to ask how those people sitting here felt that morning when they heard or that evening when they heard someone give testimony that because of their actions, because of their invitation, that a life or a family had been forever changed. I don't have to wonder how they felt. I know exactly how they felt. They felt like their heart was about to come out of their chest. Because it's at that moment when you recognize and realize that, I have helped change somebody's life. It's the whole purpose of life. There is no greater feeling. There is no greater high. And when that happens and we experience it, even in that moment, when you hear your name mentioned, is when you got to choose. Boy, this feels good. Am I going to keep it or am I going to give it? Because ultimately, it wasn't you that did it anyway. It was him working through you. Celebrate and worship every life that has changed and then watch how many more opportunities God will give you. I'll share a funny story with you in closing. Josh and I had this thing going last year when we were doing outreach and stuff, this little fishers of men kind of thing. And after one of our Thursdays or whatever, we, we through our experiences, I can't even remember all the details, but I know somebody came to Christ the first time. And I even sent Josh a text later and said, as fishers of men, from now on, anytime we see somebody come to Christ like that and we've got to play a role in it, I'm going to McDonald's to buy me a fish sandwich as a fisher of men, that's going to be the way I celebrate. And I'd done that several times, and I'd send him a text. If that happened and something experienced, whatever, I'd say, got a fish sandwich. But it had been a while since that happened. Well, after we had those ten decisions here a couple of weeks ago on Thursday night of VBS, when I left here that night, I'll be honest with you, I had forgot about my fish sandwich celebration. Now, I wasn't going to go buy uh, ten fish sandwiches. It was just one is the kind of... You know, it's my way of acknowledging to God, but I forgot about it. And so as I was driving home that evening, I was kind of hungry, and I said, man, I'm just going to stop by McDonald's. But I wasn't thinking about a fish sandwich. I said, I'm going to just get me a double cheeseburger. And I pulled up at the window, and I ordered and got the double cheeseburger, and I was riding down the road, and I couldn't wait because, like I said, I was really hungry at the moment. And I opened that thing up, and I took a big bite of it, and I started chewing This ain't a double cheeseburger. What is it? You won't believe what it was. It was a fish sandwich. But listen, it wasn't a regular fish sandwich because after I swallowed that first bite and before I could really take the second, all of a sudden my mouth was on fire. And I'm not a hot, spicy person kind of guy. Anything more so than Bojangles chicken, it just, that ain't my thing. Matter of fact, I even, this week when I was going through McDonald's one day, started looking up there on their menu to see, do they even have a spicy fish sandwich? And if they do, it ain't on the board. But not only did I get a fish sandwich handed to me, it was a fish sandwich with a little bit of heat to it. That thing lit me up. Now, I don't know if that was God's comical way of reminding me or what it was, but I'll promise you this, I ate every bite of that sandwich fanning my tongue in between bites. But we need to celebrate every time that we know God has used us in some small, insignificant, or even big or major way to be a part of change in somebody's life. Celebrate. Worship. Give Him the praise for it. And watch how many more opportunities He gives us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You today for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for situations such as this that we see first and foremost that you yourself will never allow distance nor storm nor anything else to keep you from getting to one person who needs you father give us that type of heart give us that type of heart lord that we're willing to go out of our way give us those type of eyes that we're able to see people lord that aren't going to distribute all the things that this, or aren't going to um, display all the things this man had going on in his life. But give us eyes to see that those who are just as lost as he is. Help us. So that we would not only be willing to go out of the way, but be willing to show someone the way. Lord, if
Lord, it's never going to be easy. It's pretty much always going to be inconvenient at an inopportune time. But we have to be willing to go out of the way. We have to be willing to show them the way. We have to be willing to go all the way. And if we will, we will see you change this world using us as part of that agent of change. One person at a time. All to the glory of your name for the expansion and growth of